Amen. So, without further ado, then, we are going to get up and running with the message today. We are ready. All right. We're ready to get started. How many of you guys were here last week? How many of you remember the homework that I gave you guys last week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, who did it? Who did it? Don't lie. No lying here, okay? <laughs> so, so, just with a shake of a head, yes or no, did God show you anything new that you didn't know before when you were reading it? I see some shaking, yes. Okay, I'm excited. Last week we were talking about hearing and listening, the difference between it. We talked about the straight edge and rightly dividing truth and, um, and just really, you know, um, that there is a difference between hearing, which is, you know, our physiological action of being able to uh, process sounds, and listening, which is actually the psychological way that we interpret those sounds that we are hearing. Okay, so there's a difference. And this actually brings us, you know, we talked uh, about Matthew 13, 15, where it says, for the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see it and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. And this really, you know, makes us think about that this is a heart condition. Whether we can hear or not, it comes back to where our heart is and are we opening up our heart to listen and to be able to process what God is saying to us or are we closed off to what he is saying, right? You know, we, we um, in um, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. I like that. Nobody needs to be ashamed in the godly work that you do. And it says, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. And you know, in the Bible, it talks about in, in John that the truth, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And so we have a responsibility not just to hear the word of God, but to be able to listen to what God is saying and to what he's put forth in his word through authority and all of these types of things so that we can actively put that to, to work and to practice into our lives. How many are with me Amen. right now so far? Amen. You're with me? I'm with you. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right. And one of the things I want to bring out is that that last part, it says, and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. You know, God's word, right, is to go forth. The message of God, the truth of God is the purpose, right, is to go forth and to be able to bring healing. Bring healing to your spiritual man, to bring healing to that emotional man, to bring healing into your physical body. This was the purpose, right, of, that, of the word of God is to bring and set the captives Free. Amen? Amen. Now I want to get started reading. We're going to start reading in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Okay, you guys with me today? And it says, now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And Eli was the, high, the priest at that time. And it says, and the word of the Lord was rarer in those days with no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place. And when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see... And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, when the ark of God, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down. There's a whole lot of little things happening here. And it says that the Lord called Samuel, and he, said, and he answered and said, Here I am. And so he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and he lied down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And Eli, he answered, he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Can you imagine how, could you imagine what's going on here in this scenario? He's now here twice, he goes, sees Eli, and Eli says, you know what, I haven't called you, man. And so it says, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. This is the third, say the third time. So he arose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am for you called me. And you know what Eli says to him? He says, then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. And therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. 
And it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both the ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. And so this is where we're going to get started today. You know, there's, you know, last week we talked a lot about, you know, even the, the process, right, of, you know, refusing to listen. You know, there was a circumstance, you know, where they're talking about, you know, like putting their hands on their ears because they didn't want to hear the truth of what Stephen was saying. It talks about in other situations, you know, where they actually stuck their fingers in their ears so they could not hear, right? And so today we're going to, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about having open ears to be able to hear what needs to be said, what, what the truth of what God's word has to say. That's what we're going to focus on. We're going to talk a little bit about some of these uh, hindrances as well to hearing properly. Yeah, so the question really is, how do we keep our ears open? And if, if you can just put the, um, the very first scripture, I'm like, I'm trying to see if that scripture is the same scripture. First Samuel 3, verse 1, okay? And it says, I, sorry, I said it wrong. But first, first Samuel chapter three, verse one, it says, now the boy Samuel. And I told you guys last week that I got really stuck on that phrase because I'm like, there is so much into this phrase. Now the boy Samuel, actually this whole thing, now the, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And so the first thing I wanna bring out is that when we need to be able to hear God, what we need to do is become a, like a child, have childlike faith and humility. So here it's talking about now the boy Samuel. Do you know that it says, it refers to Samuel as a boy, as a child, as he grew a bunch of times between um, 1 Samuel 2 and 3. And so I'm like, if they keep repeating the fact that this boy Samuel, the, the child Samuel, and that he grew, then there's got to be something to this. Okay, because he wasn't just like a little baby at this point, right? Because his mother, um, he, she had him until she weaned him off uh, off milk, and then she gave him to the house of the Lord, to Eli. So we know that he's, he's got to be, you know, a certain, a certain age at, at this point. Um, I was reading the book of Josephus this morning. <laughs> Some light reading, um, if you guys want to read the book of Josephus. Um, and, it, and it said that um, he was about 12 years old when this whole scenario happened, okay? So all this time talking about how he grew. But the, what I want to get across is that we need to have that childlike faith and humility. And the word boy is the word na'ar, and it means to shake off, to shout out, or to show emptiness. And it really refers to a state of humility. And we know who else had humbled themselves and had come here to earth. How many know who I'm talking about? Jesus Christ, who gave up his divine privileges to come here and to redeem mankind. And so we can see in, in Philippians 2, 7, it says, instead he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And so, you know, we can see that Jesus Christ humbled himself. And there's a scenario that he talks about, and this is in Matthew. Is that where I'm at? Matthew 18. Matthew 18, when Jesus calls to him a little child, and it says, and Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you know little children, they, they trust. They, they have a natural born need to trust. See, when a baby is born, they don't have to build up trust. They don't have to be taught how to trust. They automatically are trusting who they are in, in, entrusted to, right? And it's over time on whether they unlearn that trust or they learn that not everybody is to be trusted right? But we have a need inside that needs to get like that little child where we trust God, where we give up everything that's inside of us and we say, God, I need you. Luke 18, 17 talks about it like this. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And you know, Samuel really approached God with this faith and this humility, and he, and he came to God as a little child. And, and the fact that it keep, keeps saying that there um, just really like stuck out to me. And what he did was he set aside all pride. 
He set aside everything that was trying to make him think like he's the best, like he's got it all together, and like he knows what he's doing. And he set that all aside, and he listened to his authority as God is calling him. Yeah, see, what had happened in that particular case, right? What is it saying God's word? It says that God resists the proud but gives grace unto the humble, right? So he's not resisting Samuel by any means in this particular situation because he is open with humility. And when you're open with humility, one of the things that takes place here is that Samuel was in the process. He, he honored God. Look at the one next to you and say, honored God. You know, when we honor people, we are open to be able to receive from those individuals, okay? You know, if you're, you know, in a fight, you know, just say with your spouse, okay, and you're not very honoring to that individual, or you don't think very much, or you don't think very well of, of, of that spouse next to you, you're dishonoring them, you're not going to be able to hear or receive anything that they have to say. You guys with me on that? You guys understand? So when we, when we honor, it actually talks about when we honor God, right? That instead it, it opens up. We're not going to be able to hear from him if we're, if we're not honoring him. So honor is very important in all of our relationships, not only with God, but one another. And this keeps our ears open to be able to hear what they are saying to us. The other thing that really sticks out is when you're talking about unbelief and faith, one of the, op sorry, the opposites of faith is really that of unbelief. It's, it's, it's something that's inside, right, that really spurs out, and a lot of times it's very connected to doubt and fear. Say doubt and fear. When you look at uh, James 1, 6, it says, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let it not, sorry, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord in that circumstance. So listen, when we're in doubt, when we're in unbelief, when we're operating in fear, it says that it no, let no one even expect to receive from God. If you're not receiving from God, you know what you're not receiving? You're not hearing his words. Your ears are shut off. We want to keep our ears open to be able to hear. You know, if I'm in a conversation, you know, if, if I'm afraid, okay, and I'm in a conversation with somebody and I'm afraid of them or I don't trust this particular individual, okay, because of, of whatever circumstances that are going on, you know what's also going to happen? I'm not going to be willing to hear what they have to say, okay? If, if I'm in fear, if I'm in doubt, if I'm in unbelief, right, what, I, what, what they say to me, I, I've already shut my ears off to be able to hear what they're speaking to me. You guys understand what I'm talking about? You know what I'm, you guys have been in those situations before? And see, this is, these are hindrances, okay, that don't allow us to be able to hear properly. And the goal here is, is that we want to have what? Open ears to be able to receive. And one of the ways that we keep our ears open is that we operate in faith. We need to get fear and unbelief and doubt out of our lives so that we can hear properly the word of the Lord that is speaking to us. And... I'm just going to insert a new little section into this point before. <laughs> so I'm going to go off script just a little bit. But this is part of what I was, I was studying out this morning. But, um, okay, I want to read this. Um, in the scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 3, it says, Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Okay, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And I think this, this part is a little bit later in our notes, but rare is just like something that is valuable, something that means something, and, and, and it was rare. But it, it, was, it says there was no widespread revelation here. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, there's so many things in this. But I was talking to Linda and a few of the girls and, um, on Thursday night, and I was like, you know what? Why is it saying, like, before the, the lamp of the Lord went out? And I'm trying to study this out this morning. And as I'm reading it, and I'm seeing that it says that the word of God was rare in those days. And there was no widespread re revelation. And see, people, see, what was happening is that the men of God... That Eli, his sons, were actually going out there and they were perverting the word of God. They were, um, they were causing uh, people to falter. They were causing people to stumble. And so there was this, um, 
um, muddying of the word of God. And so it, it became confusing. And there was a time where, and so I really believe that when God, when he says in there that before the lamp of God went out, he's saying, I've got to do something and I've got to speak to somebody who's going to listen to me because he'd already warned Eli that he needed to get things together in his life and he needed to deal with the sin that was in the camp. But Eli didn't do that. And so because Eli didn't deal with the sin and because what was happening was the world was beginning to get into this place where there was sin that was entering into the house of God and they, they were they were accepting it as their life and he says I am Jehovah Ori the Lord your light I am the light of the world and so in this moment before the whole of the truth gets completely locked out and and the light is completely gone we need to talk to somebody who's going to listen and we need to get the word back into the house of God and so I believe in this moment this is what was happening and so so you know we know that Samuel was hearing what God was saying but it took a process right so the second thing the first thing that we want to talk about opening up our ears is have childlike faith and humility the second thing is servant worship it says that Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli it's so interesting how it says that that, that entire phrase because it doesn't say that he ministered to Eli it says that he ministered to the Lord before Eli, which means that he submitted into his authority while he was serving God. And the word minister is actually the word meaning, to attend as a menial or a worshiper, to contribute or serve as in a servant. See, Samuel worshipped God. His whole life was dedicated to everything, the, the entire work of God. And so he knew that no matter what he was doing, he was doing it for God. And so I'm sure he saw you know, that Eli wasn't necessarily dealing with the sin that was going on with Eli's sons. And I'm sure that there was probably opportunity for him to go, you know what, this house is kind of a crazy house. You know what, this guy's not dealing with stuff, he's not worth listening to. He probably had many opportunity to do that, but it says that he, Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. And so we can see in Colossians, Colossians 3. 3, 17, it says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then if we jump down to verse 22, it says, Bond servants, that's you and I. We're the servants of God in the house of God today, amen? It says, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's a really um, interesting phrase. Obey in all things, not some things, not, you know, the things that you agree with, the things that you, you know, obey in all things, your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, meaning you're not doing it so that everybody's seeing you do it. And like, wow, look at them. They know what they're doing. They, look at, they're, they're right up there in the front. They, they are, wow, they're great people. They're serving. Don't do it for that. You don't do it for the accolades. It says as men pleasers. As men pleasers. And, you know, and there are people like that as men pleasers, but do it in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And verse 23 says, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. See, we are not serving men. We are serving God before man. And so we have a responsibility in the house of God to reach out and serve one another in love. But we are not, um, we're not ministering, we are serving the Lord before men and women. And we are doing the Lord's work. So it doesn't matter how people might treat us. It doesn't matter what we walk through, what we are walking through. We know that when we are doing things for God, that he's carrying us all the way through it. And he'll lead us and he'll guide us in the way that we need to go. So we need to have that servant worship. And as we have that servant worship, the other thing in that, in that part was that so many times in, in this whole um, scripture, not Colossians, but um, 1 Samuel, talks about Eli being in his place. Talks about Samuel going back to his place. And he laid down in his place. And he was in his place. And how many know when we are trying to listen to the voice of God, if we are not in our rightful place of where God has put us and where God has called us to be, we're going to have a hard time hearing God's voice because we might get distracted by the things that are going on around us. We might be hearing other voices that are happening. So we need to make sure that we are in the place where God has planted us, where he has put us. The third thing on how to hear God's voice, 
Value God's word, value the truth. It says the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Rare is, this is what I was talking about earlier, it, it means precious, valuable, weighty. It's like, it's so incredible. And we need to make sure that when we are talking about the word of God, when we are thinking about his word and what he's saying and what he's doing, that we're not just frivolous with it and that we're not careless with what he's saying, but we are listening to every word. We are sitting on the edge of our seat saying, God, I need you to speak something so specific. I need to hear your voice. And he's so faithful. He will always speak to us and he will always do that. And so we need to make sure that we are not um, engaging in distractions. In this world that we live in, it is so easy to be distracted. It is so easy to hear things that are not truth and to be, you know, set aside or kind of like turned down this way or turned down that way because we're not completely focused and treasuring and valuing the word of God for what it should be. Sometimes we value other people's word over what God has said. Sometimes we value what, what people are instilling inside of us and we have all these voices that are beginning to speak into us and we're starting to listen to the masses of people instead of listening to what God is saying to us. And sometimes what God is saying does not line up with the way society tells us that we should do things. And so sometimes you've got to go against the grain. Sometimes you've got to live a life where you're just doing things a little bit different, where you're set apart, where you're consecrated, where you're doing things the way that God has called us to do things and not the way that we feel that we need to do things because of what other people say. Amen. Amen. And you know what? It, as, as just to tie into this, you know, we were talking, she's talking about distractions and apathy. These are things that can close off our ears. You know, in the New Testament, there was a situation with, the, with two sisters, Mary and Martha, okay? And it says that in, in that particular story, you had one, one sister who was upset because the other sister was sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to what he had to say. It says that, who, it said, Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But then Martha complained about it, and Jesus says to Martha, 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 why are you worried and troubled about these many things? But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her, right? Are we valuing God's word, or are we just caught up in the busyness of life? Are we caught up with all the this, 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 and this, right? We need to, to pay attention to take the time to sit and listen at the feet of Jesus. And here's the thing, Martha doing the work of God, she was cleaning the house, she was making, preparing things, she was getting things ready. Is there anything wrong with doing those things? Not at all. They're great things. They are things that we actually need to do. We need to put our hand forth to the plow and we need to get things done. But the problem was, was her, her priorities were out of order. And instead of taking the time to actually sit before Jesus and listen to him and hear his word, what she decided that she was going to do is busy herself with all of the other things. See, no matter what you are doing, no matter where you are serving, you always first have to go back before God and you've got to take that time to get in his presence. You can't expect that you're going to be able to accomplish the will of God unless you are spending time in his presence. You've got to allow his presence to get inside of you, to transform you, and to change your life from the inside out. And if you don't do that, you're going to be doing work, and it's, it's not going to be unto God. It's going to be in vain, because he said, come to me. Amen? Amen. So the next step that we want to really talk about here is that, you know, when we want our ears open, is, is that we need to sometimes, we need to seek spiritual guidance and remove filters, okay? So in this, it says that, e, it says that Samuel actually ran to Eli. He ran into the house of God to be able to seek his spiritual authority at this moment, to be able to listen to what he had to say. It doesn't say that he went to his friend. It doesn't say that he continued to just stay in apathy and lay on his bed. He didn't go listen to his favorite YouTuber. It's it says that he went and he ran to Eli, okay? And as he went and he ran to Eli, there was something that took place in that because Eli was able to give him instruction. He was able to give him a different perspective of what was happening. He heard a voice calling him, but he didn't recognize that it was God who was calling him. He didn't recognize how he was supposed to respond and be in the right place to be able to be listening to the voice of God in that moment. And Eli gave him 
that instruction. And so as he's going through this process, one of the things that he, uh, Samuel had to do is he had to really realize how to remove certain filters that were going on in the way that he was listening. See, his filters were, he, he heard his name being called Samuel, Samuel, but, he, but through the filters of his ears, it sounded like Eli was calling him. And he had to go through this process of understanding how to remove the proper filter, right? What does a filter do? You know, you, it's like a strainer. You can throw, you know, put water through and you're straining something out and all the little debris and all the little things that can act as a hindrance is they get caught in the filter, right? And so sometimes when we're trying to hear, we hear through filters. How many know what I'm talking about? It's like the same thing. We got the filters on our eyes. And so we see things in a certain way, which isn't really the way that they actually are, or we hear things in a certain way and it's not really what is actually being said and so it says in God's word in Mark 4 24 it says then he which is Jesus said to them take heed what you hear with the same measure you use it will be measured to you and to you who hear more will be given he also says this in Matthew he says it in Luke this is something that takes place in three different gospels. You know, when Jesus is saying, or was recorded in multiple gospels, what does that mean? It means we really need to take heed to what Jesus is saying to us in this particular moment. And he's saying, pay attention to what you listen to. Pay attention to what you hear. This is so you're not misinformed. It's so you're not deceived. It's so you're not led astray. And this is what happens when we have filters on our ears. We need to be listening and paying attention to the things that we hear. And are we hearing truth? Are our ears shut off and filtering out that which God is actually saying to us? That's right. So there's three main filters that we're actually going to talk about right now real quick. The first one is perception and interpretation. Perception is actually the ability to hear, to see, or become aware of something through your senses. How many have five senses? Nobody? Okay. I would think that everybody has five senses, um, that you have senses and the ability to be able to perceive things, okay? Um, Isaiah 6, 9 says, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. And so, you know, there's this whole thing where there's perception of what you see, and there's interpretation, of what you see. An interpretation or prophecy is the act of explaining um, the meaning of something, okay? And I, I think I was talking about this a couple weeks ago or not, but, you know, one of the things with prophecy and with prophets in today's day is that you have a lot of these prophets who are, who are going out and they're, and they're speaking what God is saying to them, and it seems to line up, but then they're also giving their interpretation on top of it. And a lot of times the interpretation doesn't necessarily line up with what the word that God is actually giving, given. And so then you find a lot of people who probably do have the ability to prophesy who are feeling like they're false prophets or they're being called false prophets because they're also putting their interpretation on the prophecy and the things that are given. And, um, you know, there's this, there's this story in 1 Samuel 15. You guys probably know it well and this is when Samuel goes to Saul and he tells Saul the Lord says that you have to do something you guys know what he said to do utterly annihilate the Amalekites he's like leave nothing undone they've got to be annihilated and you must do it and so if we go there in verse 3, it says, this is Samuel saying, No, go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. But if we jump down to verse 9, it says, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. See, I don't know what happened here, but somehow between the word of God coming forth and saying utterly destroy, and then a couple of verses later, they didn't do it. But what's they interesting- They were unwilling. It, they were unwilling. But what's interesting about it is that when we jump down to verse 13, it says, then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to Samuel, this is Samuel, who's giving him the word of the Lord, who said, utterly destroy these people. And he says, Saul says, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And so 
What happened between these verses? The Lord said something specific, and then Saul decided that it probably wasn't accurate and that we should spare the good parts of things and just, you know, the worthless things and the things that I deem are not good, we're going to get rid of, but we're going to keep all the good stuff. And then he comes back and he actually believes he performed the word of the Lord. And he's coming back to the, the prophet of God and he's like, it's a blessed day today. Blessed are you. Everything's great. And I just prefer, performed the word of the Lord and you should be very proud of me. And I can imagine being in, in Samuel's position thinking, are, are you serious right now? You, you think you performed God's word? You did, did you actually do what I said to do? <laughs> and so in this moment, we can see that there is a dilemma. But you know what? This isn't something that just happens with Saul. We can look back and we can be like, oh my goodness, come on, Saul. Like you could have, you could have figured that out. It was fairly clear cut. But how many times does God say something very clear cut to us and we put our perception on it and we, our interpretation on it and we say, you know what? We'll spare the good stuff. But the bad stuff, like obviously he wants me to get rid of the bad stuff out of my life. But this, this is a good thing. And why would he ask me to get rid of a good thing? And then we begin to put our interpretation on the word of the Lord. How many have ever felt like you've maybe walked in that, in that scenario? I'm sure every one of us can probably say we've been there before where we've misinterpreted the word of God. That's, so filter number one is that of perception and interpretations. And then you get into filter number two, which is, goes into emotions and familiarity, right? This is another filter. You know, Moses found himself in this particular uh, situation in, in the book of Exodus, where originally he, the children of Israel were out in the wilderness, and, his, and God said to him, strike the rock and water would come forth and it would, you know, the water would flow. And all of a sudden, all of this water was going to come and, and, and uh, that they had something to drink. And then later on, and in and and, and Numbers, he, God actually says to Moses the second time, he says, speak to the rock and the water will come forth. And then it says that, you know, uh, Moses got all upset at this particular moment with the children of Israel. How many, you know, how many times they were called stiff neck and rebellious? And he refers to them as being rebellious. He goes, how many how am I supposed to bring forth water? And he strikes the rock again out of, you know, out of anger. And so what happens in this particular time is that sometimes our emotions, you know, when you, you know you're angry, how many know that limbic system kicks in? How many know you say things you don't necessarily want to say, you do things you don't necessarily want to do? And we have this familiarity often even with the words that, ha that happen and they start getting muddled and confused in these circumstances. See, the familiarity with, you know, with God, what did he say the first time? He said, strike the rock. So what he did, he gets his anger, all of a sudden he strikes the rock again. And, and a lot of times we think, and we pay attention to the way that things happen, the way that someone speaks to us, the way that God's communicated, and now we're in a different circumstance and a different time, and all of a sudden, we, we, we fall back into these emotions, we fall back into the familiarities, right? It's like if you're hearing a story about somebody who you know seems to do the same thing over and over and over and over again. You know what I'm talking about? You're listening to the story right now, and you've already gapped in all of the different blanks because we already know what happens in the story, right? It may be a different story, but we filled it in on our own because this is what happens with our emotions and, and, and familiarity. And we need to pay attention. And so Samuel, in each of these steps, he had, to, he had to get past the familiarity of Samuel's voice to be able to hear what was actually happening, which was God speaking to him. You know what I find actually fairly interesting is that not just once, not twice, but three times, um, Samuel mis mistook God's voice for his authority's voice, which to me tells me that, you know, when God speaks, he's going to speak in this way that we are used to hearing what, what is normal for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, the way our authority is speaking to us and speaking into our lives, he was just used to, like, I, I listen to my authority. I go here, and he tells me what to do. And so if he's hearing his name being called, he automatically thinks that it's his authority that's calling him. And it is his authority that's calling him. It just goes beyond what his immediate authority was calling him because, you see, it goes, you know, his 
authority, Eli, and then God is above that. And so we hear that he is coming and God is trying to call his voice, call, call his name. And so the third filter that I want to talk about is delays or timing. How many have ever, ever felt like God has kind of missed the timing on something that you needed in your life? Or maybe you feel like you're in that place right now. <laughs> How many know that timing here on earth is not always the exact timing that happens in the spiritual realm, right? If we go back to, is it Genesis, where he says that a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. It's like, you know what, there are, there are differences. But there are d divine delays that might be happening in the spiritual realm that we don't understand. And sometimes we take, um, we, we want to hear God's voice so strongly that all of a sudden we're like, you know what, um, the timing is off and this should be happening at this point. And so we try to force something to happen because we're thinking the logic is that this should be going on at this point. He should have been answering my prayer at this point. I remember um, Stephanie actually gave me one of the greatest pieces of advice. Yeah, nudge her a little bit. She gave me one of the piece, greatest pieces of advice is that when you're expecting God to move on your behalf, don't put a timing on it because sometimes there's a delay and it'll happen later. And I am so grateful for that word that she gave me because the scenario that I was in in that moment I thought was so cut and dry and black and white that I thought it was just going to be over and done with within a day and you know it dragged on for a long period of time and so I'm so grateful that she kind of shook me and woke me up to say like don't just sit there and think that God is going to immediately do something today or tomorrow. He's going to do it in his timing, and you have to trust him to do it. There's two scenarios in the Bible. I know we're getting really late again. <laughs> it's okay, though. All right, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. This is, it says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. See, in the spiritual realm, there is a war that is going on, and we have angels that are fighting on our behalf. And if we're trying to force something into happen, we may be bypassing that and trying to actually get ourselves mixed into this whole war that's going on. And God says, we need to pay attention to his timing. John eleven twenty one 21 is the whole story with Martha and um, when, you know, Lazarus dies. And how many know that when Lazarus died, they called Jesus to come because he was a close friend. And so Jesus didn't just wait until, like, D Jesus didn't just come right away. Jesus waited not just the three days, but he waited the four days, which means that Lazarus was deader than dead. It means he was his, what they believed that, you know, for three days their spirit would kind of just be hovering around. And so if they came back to life, it wasn't a miracle. It was just because their spirit was still hovering around. So when Jesus waited that extra day, he was showing his miraculous power that he is the resurrection and the life. And maybe there's a point in your life where God is trying to say, I'm trying to reveal my resurrection power in your life. And you're trying to pull things back and say, no, you need to be here on day one. You need to be here on day two. You need to be here on day three. And you're forgetting the whole fact that, my power is the power that is going to change your life. My power is the one that's going to change the world. And so we need to know that sometimes there are divine delays and there is a timing thing that we need to pay attention to. And keep our ears open to the actual direction and the timing that God is actually speaking to us. The, the, the last filter that I want to talk about before we get into that, the last point to wrap up the message, is, is, is filter number four is too many voices. You know, how many times, right, you know, spiritual guidance is good in our last, right? But how many know that when we open up ourselves to too many voices, that it can bring in a whole bunch of problems, right? It can bring in confusion. It can bring in discouragement. It can bring in doubt. It can, it can get us off track. You know, when, when you hear, how many know, you know, that, that, that everybody doesn't have the same opinions, Okay, and when you just walk around every time you got a problem and you, and you talk to this person and that person and this person and this person, you're going to get all kinds of, of opinions. You're going to find yourself in, in often in a state of confusion because there's no clear direction as to what you're supposed to do because you're listening to too many voices. You've opened yourself up. Like, I mean, you got to listen to, to, to some of the things, right? You know, if you're listening, you're hanging out with offended people all the time and you're allowing those offended people to be able to speak into your life, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be an undertone of awesome 
offense that's going to be able to come into your life. If you're hanging out with rebellious people all the time, you know what's going to happen? There's going to, the advice that they give you is going to have an undertone of rebellion that's going to be able to seeping on through. If you're listening to all of like, so we have to pay attention to what's going on and the voices that were, you guys listening to me on this? This is something that is so relevant because as a body of Christ, we do this all the time. I mean, I don't know how many times you, you talk to a person, it's like, I've talked to this person, 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 and I've gotten an opinion about everybody, and this person says to do this, and this person says to do that, and now they're sitting here and they're like wondering what to do, and it's like, how am I supposed to hear the voice of God when I have so many of these different things that are opening, I'm opening myself up to you? I wanna give you some clarity of what I believe is really important in this, in this day and age, is, is that we often find ourselves in a situation where we are submitting ourselves to the counsel and the guidance of many different people who are not under submission and authority. When you submit yourself to the guidance, the counsel, the YouTuber, the false prophet, the wolf, whatever it may be, the offended individual, and they're not under the authority, they're not open to correction. And if they're not under authority, you know what they're in already? They're in rebellion. And you know what they're feeding into you? They're feeding you into rebellion. And so, so many times we, we, we don't pay any attention to what we feed our spirit man. We're not listening. We never even check to find out, is this person submitted anywhere? Are they accountable to anybody? And sitting in a pew doesn't make you accountable to somebody. Right. Are they accountable to somebody in their life? It says the word of God is there. That's what a pastor is there for in their life, to be able to bring correction when it needs to be correction. It says that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the spirit of the, the prophecies are subject to the spirit of the prophets. What does that mean? It means that, that when someone prophesies, that there should be someone who is there verifying whether or not the prophecy is actually worthwhile. On that note, what's interesting, and I know we're so late right now, but um, in yeah. <laughs> in First Samuel chapter three, ver, or chapter two, and um, what did you say about oh the prophets? And so, <laughs> wait, wait, where are we going with this? Um, I just got distracted by time. Ooh, that's a good distraction. No, it's not a good distraction. All right, in First Samuel chapter two, so he's talking about how. Um, the Lord actually sent a prophet to go tell Eli that he better deal with his household or else his, or else his household was going to be overthrown. And you know what happened? Eli went to his sons and was like, guys, come on, you got to change your ways. Stop doing this and blah, blah, blah. And they didn't. They disregarded him. They did not change anything. And so what happened was nothing. Eli did not do anything more about that. And so when the Lord called Samuel, the very first word that the Lord gave to Samuel was that he needed to go give this word to Eli. And it was a confirmation of what the first prophet actually said to him. And he said, you better get your house in order because you are going to be dealt with for the sins that you're allowing to go on underneath your care and underneath your authority. And so uh, Samuel was afraid and did not want to actually go and give this word. But in the morning when he opened up the house of the Lord, where he's serving in the house of the Lord, when he opened it up and then Eli came in and he says, Samuel, you got to tell me what the Lord said to you. And I could just imagine what Samuel was thinking like, oh, you're not going to be that excited when I start telling you what it is. But you know, he was faithful and he said every word, none of the word of God ever fell to the ground when he talked. And so when he told Eli exactly what the Lord had said to him, Eli knew that it was confirmation because he had already had that word. And it says from that point forward, everybody knew that Samuel was a prophet mm -hmm. because he spoke the word of God and none of his words, uh, none of the words of God fell to the ground. I want you guys all stand as we, as we close out today. The last thing that I just want, I want to be able to bring out is... Samuel acknowledged and listened to God. The instruction that he was given was, speak for your servant hears, right? What is really interesting in this part of the, the part that I really just want to bring out in this is, is that God was calling over and over and over again. Three times God called Samuel, and it wasn't until he responded with, speak for your servant hears, that God, re that the truth of the person who was sending the message was revealed and the truth of the message was revealed in that moment. It was when he acknowledged and when he listened and he was open to be able to receive that which God was speaking 
to him that everything shifted and he just went from hearing in that moment to listening. And that is what our challenge is for us today. Are we gonna have our ears open to be able to hear? Are we gonna be able to listen to the voice of God? Or are we going to keep our ears closed off with our fingers in, la, 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 I don't wanna hear. Why don't we pray? Father, we just thank you, Lord that you are opening up our ears to be able to hear what you are saying. God, I ask that you help us to set aside every distraction, every voice that is not meant to be speaking into our life, that you would reveal it to us so that we would open up our eyes to see that we need to submit to your authority today. God, I thank you that you are faithful, that you are the one who speaks the truth, Father. And today we open up our hearts, we open up our ears, and we open up our eyes to receive the voice of truth today. God, I just thank you, Lord, that even as we go throughout our everyday life, I thank you that your presence goes with us and that there is not a time where we will set aside your word. And I thank you, Father, that we would value and treasure your word because we know that it is so rare and so worthy and so valuable, so precious, God. We thank you that your word is powerful. Your word is alive and your word is able to even divide and, and, and check the, the very intents of our heart. God, today we just submit our lives to you and we say, speak for your servant hears. God, today we choose to listen to you and I thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, if you, if you need prayer, the altars will be open afterwards. If you need healing, if you need deliverance, if you just need, need someone to, to share with here at, at the altar, the altars will be open for you. But I just want to encourage you today as you go forth, be blessed. Go forth with open ears to be able to hear what God has to say. Go forth honoring one another, honoring God, so that you're not having blockages and pay attention, it says, take heed to what you hear. What are you listening to? What are you listening to? What are you allowing in? And who are you allowing to speak into your life this day? Go forth, make some good decisions. Let the voice of God become clear in your life and go forth and follow it. Be blessed. Have a great day. Greet the one next to you today. Tell them that they're a blessing and it's good to see them in the house of God.